Now I'd like to invite Herb Kaufman to begin our World War II lesson for today. Herb teaches a variety of military and Civil War history courses for the continuing education program at Gratz and at other local colleges. He is an executive board member of the Delaware Valley Civil War Roundtable. Welcome, Herb. Welcome. I uh, certainly hope everyone can hear me. And um, I really am honored to be able to participate, uh, participate in this program this evening. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is sharing with you some really fascinating information about some of the activity that has gone on in terms of the um, espionage and uh, counter espionage and things that occurred during World War II. But again, in the next 45 or 50 minutes, we can only kind of skim the surface of this. But we're going to do it with a PowerPoint. So hopefully, we can bring that up for you. And there we are. Um, so we're going to talk about deception, decryption, and secret agents of World War II. Or not. Herb, we hear you fine. I know, I'm trying to. And we, the... we can also see your screen just fine. There we go. All right. Um, deception is something that started very, very early. And in the art of war, a Chinese philosopher said, an army without secret agents is like a man without eyes or ears. And as early as Julius Caesar, they tried to encode their messages. And that's an early code or cipher that was used, in fact, by Julius Caesar. Very simple thing, but it was a way to try to hide his communications. Now, our daily lives and, and history is filled with different kinds of codes. Most of you are know from this story, the poem, Paul Revere's Ride, one if by land, two if by sea. When the Japanese signaled to attack at Pearl Harbor, it was climb Mount Nitaka, and one of my favorite codes, to let the French resistance know, wound my heart with a monotonous languor, and that let them know the Allies were going to attack. In our daily lives, we often see TBA to be announced, or also known as, and these again are different types of codes. Of course, maybe some of you had, I did, I had a, C, a CD uh, radio, CB radio. What's your 20? And I think we were all busy with the OK 104, and it was kind of fun to use that before we had cell phones and other communication. Of course, my uh, children and grandchildren send me messages like this, which is code for laugh out loud and have a nice day and so forth. And I think all of us are old enough to remember these, getting into the um, cereal boxes and having code rings. So codes and ciphers have been with us for many, many years. Now, the major change in this in espionage started with the wars. When a war starts, espionage became extremely important. George Washington, in his very first uh, message to Congress, his State of the Union, said that it's Im important that we have good intelligence and that secrecy and success depends on most enterprises. And if you don't have it, you're generally defeated. Two of the most famous spies, of course, in the American Revolution, Nathan Hale and Major John Andre. And he was the gentleman who was involved with uh, Benedict Arnold. During the Civil War, there were many, many spies. Civil War was loaded with espionage. With, this includes uh, Bell Boyd, uh, Pauline Cushman, and Timothy Webster. And the stories behind them are also quite fascinating. This is Margaretha Gertrude Zella. You may have heard of her. She's known as Mata Hari. And she was executed by the British in 1917 for spying for the Germans. Now, the whole thing of espionage really revolves around Guglielmo Marconi. And he created the first wireless transmission. And this was a major innovation. All of a sudden, we could send messages through the air. And the first time he did this was in 1901, when he sent the Morse code letter S from England to Newfoundland, Canada. 
Well, some, soon this became the method of communication. Now in the United States, we called it radio. And in much of Europe, it was called the wireless. So we actually had two different ways of identifying it. But all of a sudden, the air hummed with messages, military, diplomatic, private, all kinds of things started coming through the air. And of course, you know, our, our parents and grandparents were amazed by communication and list turning on the radio. Now, of course, the military figured out very quickly that this was a great way to listen in on other people. And they started establishing uh, signal stations around the world to catch radio signals from the air and as a form of military intelligence. Now, of course, when this happened, people then decided we need some way to encode the messages. You just can't start giving your name and everything over the air. So this is where the whole idea of secret codes began. And one of the first people to do this was a gentleman named Dr. Arthur Scherbius. And he was a German uh, engineer. And he got a patent for an electromechanical machine that could encrypt messages. And it used electricity to turn switches and knobs, and that's what encoded the message. He named his new machine Enigma. And this is the Greek word for puzzle. Now, the Enigma machine was very, very complicated. And it created a code or a cipher, if you will, by the use of rotating wheels. And what you would do, and I'll show you in a couple of minutes, is you would type a letter. These wheels would spin randomly, and that would create a code. Now, the German military quickly figured out that this was a very handy thing. And on the left of this picture, you can see what an Enigma machine looks like. And I'm gonna show you some originals in a few minutes. So even though the German military was limited by the Treaty of Versailles after World War I, they found that encrypting military messages was very important and they began to do so. Now this is an original Enigma at Bletchley Park in the United Kingdom, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But it gives you an idea of what these code machines look like. And again, they had 26 letters, and it wasn't like a typewriter. You had to really pound on that letter. You had to push it down really hard. It would send electrical signals, and I'll show you a picture at Bletchley Park, the inside of one of these Enigma machines, and it would send electrical impulses that would spin rotors, and you can see the plugs on the bottom. It would be routed in different ways. And if you push the letter A, it would never duplicate the letter A. It would always be one of the other 25 letters. And the Germans then added this plug board, and suddenly it became infinite. The number of possible messages you could do through the Enigma machine was absolutely infinite. 3.28 times 10 to the 114th power. Just imagine. And they then the Allies had the difficult task of trying to break the Enigma code. Now, one of the first people who was a cryptologist, that was William Friedman, and he was Jewish. And Friedman was called the Harry Houdini of codes and ciphers. What happened was that um, he got his training at a place called the Riverbank Laboratories. Now, this was a private laboratory near Chicago, and that's where he met his wife, who you see there also in the, in the illustration. And what happened was that they um, had fled from Europe because of growing anti-Semitism. They got a job in this private laboratory, and they began to, uh, just on their own, learn to break crows. So when World War I started, William Friedman went to Europe as General John J. Pershing's personal cryptographer. So the Army's chief signal officer then offered Friedman a six-month trial as a civilian cryptographer, and suddenly his career began as a United States Army employee. He was a civilian employee in the Army. Um, interestingly enough, when World War I ended, the United States said, well, we don't need any cryptology units. We don't have to, to try to see what other people are saying. And they created a staff of three. Interestingly enough, they were all Jewish men. 
and they became the War Department's Signal Intelligence Service. But they weren't responsible for breaking necessarily codes. They wrote new codes, they trained officers, uh, they tried to secure United States communications. But again, it was only three people for the entire United States Army. Now, why was that? Well, interestingly enough, the State Department, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, actually stated, gentlemen, do not read each other's mail. And he said, the chief lesson I have learned in a long life is the only way you can make a man trustworthy is to trust him. And the surest way to make him untrustworthy is to distrust him. Imagine, he then said, we don't need to break codes because it's not the right thing to do. Well, what happened is as time progressed in the 1930s, we came into conflict with the Japanese. Now, I'll be teaching, as Laurie said, a course starting on May 11th, and the first part of that course is gonna be the real story behind the attack on Pearl Harbor. And this plays a major event, and this is called Purple. Now, I will say this again, but just to let you know, code names in um, breaking codes and in espionage are nonsense words. They have nothing at all to do with the real purpose of what they're supposed to represent. These are complete nonsense words, and of course that's on purpose. So what happened is the Japanese developed a diplomatic code, and the army named it Purple. And William Friedman then, with his men, and again, there were no computers and nothing like that, they used their brains and intelligence, and they broke the Japanese code. There's a very famous book called The Man Who Broke Purple. So the United States now had the ability to read Japanese coded messages. Those messages that they obtained, they gave the code cover name MAGIC. So it was the purple code and the MAGIC message. Now what happened is the MAGIC messages were so top secret that even President Roosevelt, when he was given a message, could only read it and had to return it. No copies were permitted. This, folks, had a major, major effect on December 7th, 1941. And as a teaser, you'll have to take my class to find out why. Well, William Friedman also married a young woman named Elizabeth Smith that he met at Riverbank Laboratories. And she also enjoyed the, the art of cryptology and trying to um, decode messages. And what's really interesting is that she then became a well-known cryptographer in her own right. And she excelled, and during uh, the, the era of prohibition, she he worked for the FBI and the Coast Guard and she tracked down smugglers and bootleggers because they had codes that they tried to, when they tried to bring these things into America. And she was there as the chief cryptologist and um, really eliminated a lot of uh, alcohol, which was then of course illegal, as well as drugs coming into the country by decoding their messages. She uh, resulted in many, many arrests and convictions for bootlegging and smuggling. Now, as World War II came around, she started working again for the Navy, and she then became nationally famous because she tracked down Velva Lee Dickinson, who was known as the Doll Lady. Now, what happened was Velva Lee had an affinity. She loved the Japanese culture and the Japanese people, and she became a spy for the Japanese ministry. Now, what she did, let me just go backwards a bit. She owned a toy store where she sold beautiful handmade dolls. Now, with those dolls, she would then package them, send them around the world with coded messages. And she would watch the coming and going of military and commercial shipping in and out of New York Harbor. She would then send these encrypted messages to a contact in Argentina who would send them off to the Japanese uh, government. And what she would say is, she'll say like something like, I'm sending you a large doll. 
and that would be translated in code as, say, a large battleship or, or, or a big um, naval cruiser. So Elizabeth actually decoded these messages, and she broke the codes. The FBI was then able to arrest Velva Lee Dickinson, and she was put into prison for 10 years for espionage. Now, Elizabeth Friedman was very unknown during that time. Uh, her husband, as you, you can see, was given tremendous credit for the work he did for the government, but her work was really uncredited until just a couple years ago. And in 2017, finally, as a woman, she was given credit for the work that she did with a new book called The Woman Who Smashed Codes. And it's a wonderful story of her background and what she did to help the United States. Now, this again is an Enigma machine. And as, the, as England, and by 1939, came closer to war, the British government said, you know, we know about these codes going through the air. Remember, they could pull these things out of the air as well as anyone else. So the English government, the British government then said, we need to establish a place to break these codes. And what they did, as opposed to the United States, where everything was, dis was separated, the army had its own code breaking, the Navy had their own code breaking, um, the FBI had their own code breaking, they never worked together. But the British government said, we're not going to do that. We're going to pull everyone together. And what they did is they created the Government Code and Cipher School at Bletchley Park outside of London. And that, yes, that is me. I was uh, privileged a couple years ago to get to London, and we took the train and went out to see Bletchley Park, which is now a wonderful uh, museum of uh, espionage and coding. And at this place, they brought in the brightest minds in England. They brought in mathematicians, uh, economists, chess masters, just about anyone they could find who had a, a knowledge of numbers to sit down and try to figure out these, these infinite number of codes that the Germans could create with the Enigma machine. One of the most famous of these code breakers, and there were many, was Alan Turing. And Alan Turing was um, the guy who really came up with ideas that today became the modern computer. And what he did at Bletchley is he created something that he called the bomb, B-O-M-B-E. And this was a set of um, wheels that really recreated about 30 Enigma machines altogether. Now, that was kept in this particular top secret hut um, at Bletchley Park. And the bomb was this device. And what happened to construct it, they went out to the various companies in England, and each of them had a different part, but they didn't know what the part was for. And when it came to Bletchley, it was put together by the scientists at Bletchley, and they created what basically became the first computer. There were hundreds of vacuum tubes. You might remember the old televisions where we had those giant tubes in the back. Well, this was run through hundreds of these uh, different vacuum tubes. And Alan Turing is the one who actually invented this concept. Now, at the end of the war, these were so secret, and I still don't understand why, but the British government destroyed them all. So there are no original bombs left. They were all gone. This is a recreation of what it looked like at the Bletchley Park Museum. Now, if you're interested in, in Hollywood's take on this, which is kind of fun, it's a good movie called The Imitation Game with um, Benedict Cumberbatch and Kira Knightley. Um, so um, you can write that down and kind of watch it and give you a little idea of what some of these people did at Bletchley Park. Now, the big break in espionage came. The British in 1941 captured a um, German submarine. And what I'm doing tonight also, if you want to take some notes, if you're interested in reading further, I do have a lot of books that I'll show you that will come up so that you'll see what books are out there in case you want to follow up and do some reading on your own um, while you're home. So what they did is they captured this German submarine. And this young lieutenant, 
got into the submarine and he didn't know what it was, but he grabbed this machine and code books and it turned out this was an original German secret Enigma machine with the code books. Of course, this came to Bletchley and this became one of the biggest secrets of World War II. We became known as Operation Primrose and Churchill did not even tell Roosevelt until the middle of 1942 that they had broken the German codes. Now it's important to understand this was not a computer like today. And even with the machine, they would take them about five to eight days to actually break a coded message, but they were able to do it. Of course, now the world changed for us on December 7th, 1941. And within three days, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States, and we began to prepare for what we knew then was going to be a long war. FBI under J. Edgar Hoover took immediate steps, and they were responsible then for catching espionage agents and possible saboteurs in the United States. His counterpart was a, a German admiral named William Wilhelm Canaris, he was head of the German military intelligence called the Opfer. Now, the Opfer was not the Gestapo. The Opfer was military intelligence, and there are many historians who believe that Canaris did not have his whole body and soul into this adventure. And this is shown by the fact that he saw himself as a German, as a nationalist, but not as a Nazi. And there is actually, although I have not been able to nail down where this comes from, but some historians said he actually tried to save many Jews by assisting in smuggling them out of Germany. We do know he was arrested by Hitler and was executed right before the end of the war by Hitler. In Germany then, the counter espionage was brutally carried out by the Gestapo. The first big situation that occurred in 1942 in the summer was the FBI discovered an opfair plot to have land saboteurs in the United States. Now today we don't call them saboteurs, we call them terrorists. And what they were supposed to do was blow up plants and different things in America. Uh, this is the gentleman, Walter Coppy, he was a, um, had worked in America, and his plan was to get saboteurs, terrorists, send them to America so they can then blow up munitions factories, aluminum plants, um, dams, anything they could find. And they recruited eight men. Two of them were U.S. citizens, and the other six others had worked in the United States. They gave them a three-week training in the use of explosives and timing devices, and put them on a submarine and sent them to the United States. Now, four of them landed on Long Island, which is another interesting story because they were sighted, and four of them then landed in Florida, and they met later to discuss their plans. But here's what happened, a really interesting story. And again, this is just a picture of two plants. This was the idea. They were to literally blow these things up. They were, as we know today, terrorists. And this is George Dosh. Now, George Dosh was one of these eight terrorists. But Dosh and another guy with him named Becker, but Dosh was kind of the ringleader. Dosh did not see himself as a Nazi. He thought what the Nazis were doing were wrong. And he really hated Germany, but he couldn't get out. And what he found was, hey, I'll join this movement because I speak English and I'll get a free ride to America on a submarine, which he did. And as soon as these four guys arrived in Long Island, he made his way to FBI headquarters in Washington and said, I'm George Dosh, here I am, I'm a German terrorist. Now the FBI did not believe him initially, and after a rather lengthy uh, interrogation, finally accepted it, and they wound up arresting all eight of the saboteurs. And the picture on the left, you can see, they dug up their munitions and explosives and things that they have left had left buried in the sand that they were going to use. 
Well, at that point, Roosevelt, as opposed to today, where uh, they use different methods, they were tried before a military tribunal. And they, within a month, six of them were taken to uh, the District of Columbia prison, where they were executed by the electric chair. Dosh and Becker, on the other hand, uh, were sentenced to prison. And in 1947, Truman granted them clemency for their cooperation. And interestingly enough, instead of staying in the United States, they were sent back to Germany. I'm not sure what kind of welcome they got there, but they were sent back and kind of disappeared into history. Now, this particular adventure called the Pastorius Operation became very well known in the United States. And here are just four of the books that are written about this single uh, terrorist or espionage activity, the invasion of Nazi saboteurs. And again, there's some books that are around, um, some of them in the library, some of them you can pick up uh, probably on Amazon uh, if you're interested in, in reading more about these, this particular case. It got a lot of press in, back in the 1940s and 50s. Now, more saboteurs happened. This was really interesting. Now, the German General Council had offices in, the, in New York. And what happened was that uh, the government, the United States government, once the war started, threw out the Germans. They said, pack up and you have to go back to Germany. So the Opfair, the military intelligence that were there, took all their uh, papers, their secret papers, and they took them down to the um, incinerator and of course, the custodian was a, a German. And they said to the custodian, take these secret papers and burn them. Now, the incinerator had two sides. One was lit and one was not lit. So the, the, um, the custodian was, in fact, even though he was German, was very loyal to the United States. He was an American a naturalized citizen. So he took those papers and put them in the side of the furnace that was not lit. So when the Opfair military intelligence left and they walked out, he then grabbed the papers and took them to the FBI. He gave the FBI a complete roster of all the German spies then in the United States. And amazingly enough, there were 33 of them. These people had infiltrated all aspects of American life. And um, it's almost like a, a TV movie. They were living lives here in the United States, but all of them were German informants and spies, both men and women. This was the leader. His name was Frederick Fritz Duquesne. He came, uh, was a naturalized American citizen, but he spent his entire life as a German spy and intelligence officer. And he ran this corps of 33 German spies. And here's a few of them. Now, what they actually did is they worked in aircraft plants, factories. Uh, they worked all kinds of places. They uh, looked at for airline schedules, ship schedules, anything that would be of value to German intelligence. Now, they were caught up by this gentleman. Another fascinating story and his name is William Seabold. Now, William Seabold was a naturalized American who was of German extraction. Uh, he went back to Germany in 1939 to see his mother, and he was immediately arrested by the Gestapo. Now, he was not Jewish. Um, and um, 1939, of course, the Germans were arresting just about everybody who didn't fit their mold, if you will. And they took him and they said, listen, Here's what you will do. You are going to go back to the United States, and you're going to basically, he was supposed to be the 34th spy of this huge spy ring and saboteur ring that was in the United States. Now, Sabold was a naturalized citizen, but loyal to the United States. And what Sabold said is, wait a minute, I don't want to do this. But of course, he knew if he didn't do what the Gestapo said, his family would be murdered. Well, he thought, and interestingly enough, he went back to the Gestapo and he said, gentlemen, I've lost my passport. I can't go back to America. And it was a subterfuge. 
because the Gestapo said, well, go over to the American consulate and get yourself a new passport. Obviously, he could not have walked into the consulate office on his own. He would have been immediately identified. So he went in with the permission of the German Gestapo, and he told the people in the consulate what he was required to do. They gave him a new passport, and he went back and, of course, immediately started to advise the FBI of what was going on. Now, this is a picture of Sebold with Fre Frederick Duchesne, the head of this spy ring. And he became an FBI informant, basically a double agent. And he worked then with the FBI when they captured all 33 of these spies. They were sentenced to a total of over 300 years in prison. And his story was in a book written in the early 1950s called Double Agent, the first hero of World War II, and how the FBI outwitted and destroyed a Nazi spy ring. Another great, great story. Now, moving on, we want to talk a little bit about military deception. And I think it's important that everybody understands nothing in the military is what you see. And during the war, the Allies had many, many different covert deceptions and operations in order to uh, deceive the enemy of their true plans and intentions. Now, many were very, very successful. And again, I want to mention to you that the code names have nothing to do with the actual military operation. Again, these are nonsense words that really have nothing to do with what the operation really is. The first one we're going to talk about is Operation Mincemeat, and that was part of a larger deception termed Operation Barclay, which was designed to mask the Allied invasion of Italy. And this idea comes about in something called the Trout Memo, and the Trout Memo, nothing to do with fishing, again, it's a nonsense word, and it was written by a gentleman who was a commander in the uh, military intelligence of Great Britain, and his name was Ian Fleming. Now, you may know that name, Ian Fleming. He was a spy intelligence officer and a commander of special operations, as we call it today, during World War II. And of course, after the war, he wrote the Bond books. But during the war, and again, it's really interesting that James Bond's rank is Commander Bond, as was uh, Commander Ian Fleming. And he wrote a paper called the Trout Memo, which said, you know, one of the ways to deceive the enemy is to get misleading papers and identification on a corpse and float that corpse up to, to the enemy. They would find the information and that would add to the deception. Um, this covert operation, as he wrote, was called GoldenEye, which later became a James Bond book. He also started a group of um, insurgents. Today, we call them special forces. Uh, he called them the Red Indians, and they uh, engaged in sabotage and guerrilla warfare inside of Germany. And there's a wonderful book called Ian Fleming's Commandos, and some people say that his commandos were the basis of the movie The Dirty Dozen. Also, and this is kind of fun, this is just a fun fact for you, Sean Connery, if you watch the movie The Longest Day about the D-Day invasion, one of the big Hollywood movies, you will see Sean Connery in 1962 running up the sand as a Scottish soldier with a little bit part. And that same year, of course, he's cast as Bond, James Bond. So it's interesting to see how these um, careers change. Well, 1943, now that big long name you see, you see there, C-H-O-L-M-O-N-D-E-L-E-Y, it's actually pronounced Chumley. That's the British for you. And um, what he did is he found the Trout Memo, and he thought this was a great idea to add to the deception and subterfuge of the Allied invasion of Sicily. So he came up with uh, this idea from the Trout Memo. He recruited Captain Ewan Montague, a British intelligence officer. 
And they said, what we're going to do is find a body. We're going to give him a, a fake persona, float him up to the Spanish coast. The Spanish will get the, this information. We know they'll give it to the Germans and it will add to the deception. So they found a, what we call today a street person. His name is Glender McMichael. And he had died from ingesting rat poison. And what they did is they created a fictitious name. And his name was William Martin of the Royal Marines. And they created an entire life around him. And then they planted what they call pocket litter on his body. Uh, they had his passport. They had a picture there of this young girl. She was a secretary for the RAF. She became his girlfriend. Uh, they had a letters to his father. They had the receipt for an engagement ring. They had all kinds of personal information. And then, of course, they also had top secret information that the Allies were going to invade in the Balkans, which is the area near Greece. Now, this top secret information was put into a valise, which was chained to his wrist. So one day in 1943, that's an actual photograph of Glender Michael, and they put him on a submarine. They said the 23rd Psalm and pushed him off on the tide towards Spain. Uh, he did float into the Spain. The Spanish picked up the body and, of course, opened the valise, copied the papers, and sent them on to the Germans. The British, of course, were demanding the return of the body of their major and um, actually put a death notice in the paper and continued that subterfuge. Within weeks at Bletchley Park, they decrypted German communications that showed that the, Brit that the Germans had bought the entire deception. The Germans actually believed that the, the Americans and British were going to invade in the Balkans. The Opfair or the military intelligence brought into the Rus completely. Hitler started pulling troops out of Sicily to strengthen the Balkans. And of course, the rest, as we know, is history. On July 9th, 1943, the Allies invaded Sicily. And even as they were landing in Sicily, Hitler continued to pull troops out to reinforce Sardinia in the Balkans, where he assumed that the attack was going to be made. This completely fooled the Germans. Glender Michael was given a, a later after the war, was buried in Spain. He was given a military funeral and a uh, recognition for um, his service, if you will. And it said, with a dental, General Bush, a dead man was on his way to fight for Britain. After the war, a book was written called The Man Who Never Was. And then later in 1956, there was a movie based on this story called The Man Who Never Was. True story. And now we get to Operation Bodyguard, which was the name, a part of the name of the invasion of D-Day of 1944. Now at the top there, you see that orange that is in there, and that is Pas de Calais. And the Germans firmly believed that this would be the invasion point, that this was the closest part to England over the stormy English Channel, and that the British and the Americans would invade Europe at Pas de Calais. And of course, we um, D-Day occurred down at the bottom at Normandy. Now, something started in the way of subterfuge that resulted, worked around this gentleman, Lieutenant General George S. Patton. And I love this quote. The object of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other bastard die for his. That's Patton. Now, the Germans firmly believed that Patton was America's greatest combat officer. They also believed that if there was an invasion of Europe, it would be led by Patton. Now, the two um, Germans you see there, that's Alfred Yodel, who was the commander in chief of the, of the Western Front, and then Erwin Rommel, who was commander of the defenses of um, Europe. 
and they believed that Patton would lead the invasion. So their spies kept an eye on Patton. And now something interesting happened. While in Sicily, Patton had captured Sicily along with uh, General Bernard Law Montgomery. Patton, a very, very, very famous case when he went to the hospitals, found two soldiers suffering what was then called battle fatigue. And uh, today it's PTSD. Uh, he slapped those two soldiers. He was angry, he told them to get back to their units. This became a national furor. And what happened was that Eisenhower had no choice but to recall Patton to England. And someone, we don't know who, came up with another smart idea to deceive the Germans. They, they knew that the Germans believed Patton would lead the invasion. So they gave Patton an army, and it was called the First United States Army Group. The only problem with this army is it was, didn't exist. This was Patton's ghost army. It was one of the most elaborate deceptions of the entire war. It involved double agents, fictional radio transmissions, and a rubber and balsa wood army. They created hundreds of tanks, landing craft, um, submersive vehicles, ships, everything made of balsa wood and rubber and blew it up and had it in fields. So when the Germans flew their reconnaissance overhead, they saw this enormous buildup of men and material, which was all completely fake. They even had trucks driving around with tooling tools to make tread marks, making it look like these vehicles were moving in the fields. Uh, they wore fictional uniforms. That's the actual patch there for the first United States Army group that of course didn't exist. Um, they kept pl planes up in the air to protect, if you will, these uh, soldiers. And of course they weren't that good at protecting. They made sure the Germans took pictures of it and this enabled them to then deceive the Germans who were then keeping an eye on Patton. Now, other parts of this deception, this was really interesting, was called Operation Copperhead. And the gentleman on the left is a lieutenant in the British Army, Myrick E.C. James, who looked like Field Marshal Bernard Law Montgomery on the right. And they dressed him up as Montgomery and sent him out to inspect the troops and to make plans for the invasion. And of course, the Germans then followed the fake Montgomery, while the real Montgomery was in England working with Eisenhower on the real invasion. And true to form after the war, uh, he wrote a book called I Was Monty's Double. And then there was a film released in 1958 of the same name. Again, there was a double cross committee or double X committee. Uh, this was one of the um, double agents that were, they were called Brutus and Garbo. Uh, they were double agents. The Germans thought they were working for them. And in fact, they were working for the British and the Americans. And they were so successful that even on June 9th, uh, three days after D-Day, uh, Hitler kept his troops because he believed that um, Patton was going to attack at Pas de Calais, that the Normandy invasion was a feint and the real attack would be made by Patton. And Hitler held his large 15th Army and two panzer divisions at Pas de Calais waiting for General Patton to attack. Now Patton's ghost army was so successful that following D-Day, the army created, our army created the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops. This was 1,100 men. They also continued to use inflatable tanks and vehicles, and they staged over two dozen battlefield deceptions to fool the Germans into thinking there were soldiers where there weren't. And just recently, several books have been written called The Ghost Army of World War II. One other deception of D-Day, which I really found kind of neat, and that's where the, the Ruperts, now this was called Operation Titanic, 
And Rupert was this little character you see there. And these were 500 three foot four tall dummies. They looked like paratroopers. And what they did is they, during D-Day, they actually took these uh, dummies, the Ruperts, and they threw them out of the airplanes and they had carried recordings of gunfire and exploding rounds. And the Germans then sent troops to fight this huge airdrop, of course, of dummies, of Ruperts. Now, very few of them survived. There's a couple of the pictures that you see there of a few of them that did remain because when they landed, they exploded and made a lot of noise and then attracted Germans. And here's another picture of what the actual airdrop looked like of 500 Rupers, Ruperts to draw away the German soldiers. And in the movie, The Longest Day, they actually feature this when the German command looks at these little puppets you know, uh, they call them rubber puppets or gummy puppet. Last thing or a couple last things I want to talk about, and that's the Ritchie boys. This has only come to our attention really over the past 10 or 15 years. And this is one of the most amazing stories of the war. Many young men came to the United States as Jewish refugees, and they were uh, left Germany back in the early 30s when to escape Nazi persecution. And by the time of the war, they were 18, 19 years old, and they were old enough to enlist in the army. Now, the army then figured out these guys could be of value. So they found anyone who had was of German or Austrian extraction, anyone who, could, who was a native speaker. And there you see three of them from the pictures originally. They took them to Camp Ritchie, Maryland, in a top secret operation. This was one of the most highly held secrets of the war. They got very specialized training to interrogate and gain information from captured Germans. So these Jewish Holocaust survivors, young boys, were sent back to Germany and they gained information from interrogating Germans. Some of them actually arranged Germans to surrender by speaking to them in their language and telling them, of course, they were surrounded and so forth. The military exploits of the Ritchie boys are incredible. And they used uh, what we call today psychological warfare to gain information from captured German soldiers. They were also uh, helped to free the, um, the uh, concentration camps, and they worked with the American prosecutors at the Nuremberg trials. And it was only amazing in 2004 that a film called The Ritchie Boys told their story. This was the first time ever that we learned all those years after the war that this group actually existed. And recently there was a book written about the, the, the story of The Ritchie Boys. Now, in doing some genealogical research of my family, I recently discovered that my mother's cousin, his name is Ernest Kaufman, uh, served with the Ritchie boys. And I real, just found out he wrote a book called From Fright to, From Fright to Fight to Farm, his story, uh, what he did in the military, which just arrived today. So I'm gonna get a chance to read about this uh, rather distant relative of mine, but who apparently served with the Ritchie boys. That really exciting. The last thing we'll talk about is Wild Bill Donovan. He was an American soldier and is known as the father of American intelligence. He started something called the OSS, which we know today is called the CIA. And uh, if you remember the TV shows where they had, um, you know, uh, secret messages in your shoe and a pen that could turn into a gun, he's the guy who invented all these things. He actually created this. And he went out to recruit people to serve as spies during the war. I just want to show you a couple real quickly. Yes, that is Julia Child. Her name was Julia McWilliams, and she was, during World War II, a secret operate, uh, operative for the OSS, or as we call it today, the CIA. Interestingly enough, Julia Child, as you can see in the pictures, was very tall. She was actually 6'3". She met her husband during the war, who was another secret agent. And one of the things they had her do 
one of her first recipes was called Shark Sense, which was a, a recipe to try to create shark repellent for downed servicemen. And there you see her working, and the gentleman on the right is Paul Child, who she married after the war. Another person who served in the OSS was uh, Sterling Hayden. Uh, you may recognize the picture in the center. He was the police lieutenant who got shot in the head by Michael Corleone in The Godfather. Had a very long and very, very uh, well-known uh, hot career in Hollywood. He received the Silver Star for heroism during the war, working for the OSS. Graham Greene, the famous British novelist, was a spy during the war. And then Mo Burke. Uh, some of you may know the story of Mo Berg. He was a catcher, but he was also brilliant. He got a law degree. He could speak 12 languages. And they sent him to Germany to find out if the Germans were actually had the ability to construct an atomic bomb. Um, he was sent to interview this gentleman, Werner Heisenberg, who was a German uh, brilliant guy. He, he got a Nobel Prize at the age of 23. And um, he found out the Germans were in fact not close, in, close to getting an atomic bomb. And then the last two we'll talk about quickly is Virginia Hall. Virginia Hall is one of the most uh, decorated women from America of World War II. As a young girl, she lost her left leg and had a prosthetic leg. Yet she served in Europe for the entire period of the war uh, uh, both in um, espionage and in leading the French resistance. The Germans, what you see on the right is a wanted poster that was put out by the German Gestapo. They called her the limping lady, and they had a $20,000 reward, a lot of money in 1944, to capture the limping lady. But she served as a spy and with the French resistance throughout the war, uh, she blew up munition trains. She's credited with killing over 150 German soldiers, destroying bridges, and sending information back to the Allies. And here at the end of the war, she's given a distinguished service cross by General Donovan. And again, it's only recently, a book was written called A Woman of No Importance, which is the story of Virginia Hall. Literally came out last year. And on the left is a mannequin of her, which is part of the CIA headquarters museum in, um, in Virginia. And the last person we'll talk about is Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar was born in Austria, became known in America and MGM as one of the most beautiful women in the world. And yet, Hedy Lamar was also brilliant. She uh, developed a system for radio controlled torpedoes and actually today is in the Hollywood, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Inventors Hall of Fame. And she, this system she used actually transmitted signals up through 1962 in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you're interested in the future, there are many, many books out there about these various spies, the double cross system and espionage during the war. So I hope you enjoyed this. I will give you the commercial that if you uh, are interested in learning about um, the attack on Pearl Harbor and the creation of the atomic bomb, uh, the movies during the war and um, a bridge too far, then please consider taking my class, which starts on May 11th. Thank you very much. Lori? Well, thank you, Herb. You are a true Gratz College teacher and giving your advertisement to everyone. So thank you, Herb. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I, I know who to come to for advice if I'm considering espionage. Um, <laughs> that, there were very interesting ideas there, especially about floating bodies towards your enemy. Um, well, before opening up for questions, and I do have a few for you, uh, I'd like to remind the alumni out there, please don't forget to update your contact information on our website and to join the Gratz Alumni Facebook page. So we launched this Grats at Home series as a way of showing that we're here for our community in this challenging time, and we're thrilled to have received such a strong response from everyone. Among those participating tonight are alumni and current students, both local to Philadelphia and from around the world. 
And if you would like to help strengthen Gratz and make it possible for even more students across the world to participate in our online programs, please consider making a tax deductible charitable donation. Uh, on behalf of everyone at Gratz, thank you for your participation and support. And now we would like to get to some questions. Um, so Herb, let's see what we've got here. I have so many good questions for you. One of them is a personal question, actually information for you. Yeah. So I have a note from, um, checking it out here in our chat, I believe it's Nelson Mellitz, who just says general information to you. Um, by the way, Ernest Kaufman, who is your, your uh, relative, he turns 100 this year in June, in case you didn't know, and he lives in Medford, New Jersey. Really? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Uh, so you have you have somebody who knows about him, and I, if you're interested, I'll hook the two of you up and find out why uh, why we know that about you. <laughs> I just I actually just learned about what his background is, and uh, this was this that's amazing. I did not know, I had no idea. <laughs> so he's around. You need to reach out to him. Wow, cool. Um, so I do have another question. This one comes from Roberta Brooks, and she asks: Was Seibold's family in Germany? impacted by his work for the United States. Um, no, that is, did Germany no, figure out that he was not acting on their behalf? No, what happened was, uh, and it shows in his book, uh, everything was kept very, very secret. Uh, we know these things today, uh, of course, but during the war, uh, when the others were arrested, he was arrested as well, except they then quietly, obviously released him and he want, went off into relative anonymity. He kind of just disappears. Uh, almost like the, you today you might call it the witness protection program. That They didn't have that specific thing, but that's basically what they did. And they, uh, he just went, kind of disappeared into the, into the woodwork, if you will, which you were able to do in those days because you didn't have the um, you know, the internet and the, and the specific investigations we can do today so quickly. Um, there were no credit cards, things like that to track. So, um, no, he was arrested and then just literally spent the rest of his life in an anonymity. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. This one comes from someone listening um, from the Harris Memorial Library. Um, and it, it, the person asks, can you tell us something about the women who use their knitting to create coded messages for World War II? Louis, she doesn't know much about it, but it's a really interesting idea. Do you know anything about that? I have not heard about, no, I'm not sure how you would knit, knit to World War II. Um, there are, and, and, this, and again, this is part of a, a, a much larger um, investigation I, uh, that I've done in, in research of the uh, espionage during the war. Women played a major role in espionage. And I can only sp spoke really about Virginia Hall. Uh, there were so many others. Um, I'm, I, they, 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 it's just amazing how many women were involved. So I, I don't know about anybody doing any knitting or how that would have affected uh, espionage, but uh, they ran radio transmitters. Uh, they led um, the resistance in France, and women had a tremendous, tremendous effect on the outcome of the war. We just didn't have time to get into all of them today. Thank you. I know that you do have more information on this topic, but we had to uh, condense it into this hour today. Yes, so we sure did. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> I know. We worked hard to do that. <laughs> I understand. Very hard. Uh, <laughs> yes, I understand. Um, a lot of people are just making comments. Just great job to you. They appreciate what you've done here with this presentation. Really very happy with it. Oh, good. I'm great. That's great. Take my class. <laughs> you really are a grad instructor. There you um, go. Someone is mentioning there's a book about Hedy Lamarr called The Only Woman in the Room. Do you know anything about that book? No, no. What, it's <laughs> fascinating, though. Um, honestly, there are so many books that were written right after the war. Back in, in the 50s, when some of these things became um, de uh, declassified, um, there are just, oh my gosh, you could fill up a room with books on spying and espionage and different of the personalities of that era. And yet, even with that, um, we didn't learn about Virginia Hall and we didn't learn about the Ritchie boys on t and, and, um, and, and um, Elizabeth Friedman didn't get her recognition 
until till just just a few years ago. But there's a lot of material out there. If you're interested in this topic, um, you know, pick and pick choose, pick and pick wisely, because there are just so many, many books out there. Uh, wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have one last question. I'm not sure if it relates to this or not. Um, but rep several years ago, there was a book called The Devil Himself that talks about Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano, who played a major role with the mafia in the invasion yes. of Sicily. Oh, you're smiling. You know a lot about this. I certainly do. I, I, I uh, actually, um, someday, uh, Lori, we'll, we'll put together a program on the Jewish mafia between World War I and World War II. And what happened is very, very fascinating. The, the Jewish mafia was very, very important uh, in terms of the criminal activity between World War I and World War II. We all learned about Al Capone, but uh, Meyer Lansky and uh, Benjamin Siegel, they call them, don't call them Bugsy, uh, but Benjamin Siegel, Meyer Lansky, um, Lepke, Buckholtz, there are so many, uh, Arthur Flagenheimer, all of you know him, his name is Dutch Schultz. Well, these guys, uh, when the war started, supported the war effort and uh, did so much. As a matter of fact, it was the Jewish mafia that secured the loading docks. And there was never once during the entire war any incident of sabotage on the loading docks due because they were guarded by the Jewish mafia. And even the Nazis didn't want to mess with them. So there are some terrific books out um, about the Jewish participation during the war and how the Jewish mafia, um, Meyer Lansky and others, supported the war effort in, in, in many, many, many ways. After the war, with the birth of the state of Israel, the, the, the Jewish mobsters gave a lot of money to the different uh, people who came here from Israel trying to get arms and trying to get uh, money to support the state of Israel. And um, it, one quick story, one of these um, is Israeli agents went to Hollywood and met Bugsy Siegel. And he said to him, all right, I'll make sure things get done. And he gave him over $50,000. And uh, when they asked this, the, the, the Jewish representative of the Haganah, and he said, well, you know, did you want to take this money? He said, sometimes you got to take money from wherever it comes. And uh, even though he knew it was criminal money, but um, the Jewish mobster has played a major role uh, in, in getting money and arms to the new state of Israel and supporting the, the, uh, the war effort during the war. Thank you. You know, Herb, I know, I know that you're always good for a story, no matter what it is. I know I, you well. I, yes, my <laughs> wife says I'm, I'm full of uh, useless information, but what the heck, I, I enjoy okay, well, it. It's to, a lot of fun. To get, to get more stories from Herb, uh, we'll have to come up with another time or another class for everyone to hear more about it. But I want to thank you for always some good stories. Um, and to all of you who are still listening out there, um, I want to thank you for participating tonight and for allowing Gratz to come into your living room, your office, your dining room, your den, everywhere. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight um, and have a good and safe night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.